Hello. Hello, and welcome to the Wilson Center. I'm Becca Pincus, director of the Polar Institute. We are delighted to be partnering with the Fulbright Arctic Initiative on today's event. Thank you all for coming. The Wilson Center is the leading nonpartisan think tank for tackling global issues through scholarship and open dialogue. And the Fulbright Arctic Initiative offers a collaborative model for scholarly exchange to help translate theory into practice and policy. Fulbright scholars stimulate international research collaboration on Arctic issues while increasing mutual understanding between people of the United States and member countries of the Arctic Council. The COVID-19 global pandemic and Russia's war in Ukraine have had profound consequences for global cooperation, and the Arctic has not been immune. The work of the Fulbright Arctic Initiative is timely and important. I'd like to pause and thank two key figures who led the creation of the Fulbright Arctic Program as founding scholars. First, Dr. Mike Sfrega, who will be giving remarks shortly today. And second, Dr. Ross Virginia, who unfortunately can't be here in person today, but is with us virtually, I believe. Thank you, Mike and Ross, for your vision and leadership. Today, we are delighted to share with you findings from the third round of the Fulbright Arctic Initiative. I'm going to turn the mic over to the co-leads of the third and current cohort of the Fulbright Arctic Initiative, Dr. Elizabeth Lynn Rink and Dr. Greg Peltzer. Dr. Rink is a professor of community health at Montana, Montana State University, and Dr. Peltzer is a professor in the School of Environment and Sustainability at the University of Saskatchewan. Further information and their bios, their very impressive bios, can be found in your programs. Beth, Greg, thank you for joining us. Thank you very kindly, Rebecca, for that warm introduction and uh, for hosting us here at the Wilson Center. This is, uh, as you said, this is our third iteration and of the Fulbright Arctic Initiative, and today is a day of celebration, a day of sharing. And in that spirit, in my home province of Saskatchewan, we often start these events with a land acknowledgement, which I understand is also common practice here in the United States. And in that spirit, we wanted to acknowledge that we're on the ancestral lands of the Nakotank and the Piscataway, uh, uh, peoples, and we honor uh, their ancestral lands, their elders, past, present, and future. The Fulbright Arctic Initiative is part of the family of the Fulbright Program, and in that it emphasizes both scholarship and cultural diplomacy. And among this group of 19 scholars that are here with us today, and have journeyed on this program, represents the very best of the scholars and practitioners who have been tackling some of the most urgent challenges that Rebecca has identified in the Arctic region. These 19 scholars represent all eight Arctic states. It has the largest number of Indigenous representatives, five, from each of the major regions of the Circumpolar North, North America, Fendo, Scandinavia, and Russia. And among the group, we're really pleased to have four practitioners, along with our academic scholars. Everywhere, everyone from an art curator, architect, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and active duty U.S. card service personnel. Today, our scholars uh, will be sharing through what they've done in three particular groups in their policy areas. One was on security. Uh, the second was on infrastructure, and the third group was on health. And we'll be kicking off those panels, of course, with Mike Sfrega giving our keynote address. Along the few days that we've been chatting, um, there is one shout out that I would like to take the opportunity uh, to make on this journey, and that's to my co-lead, uh, Beth Rink. When we started on this three and a half years ago, and uh, Beth had reached out to me about uh, joining me to, to em em embark on this. I did so with some hesitation because of uh, uh, the, uh, particularly the disease I have. And uh, Beth reassured me she'd be there every step of the way. And 
For me, it's been a bit of a journey like that footprints poem where you see two sets of footprints and sometimes one. And where you've seen that one set of footprints, it's been the remarkable professionalism, uh, determination, grace under pressure, and foresight at Beth Rink. And Beth, I owe you a debt of, uh, <laughs> debt of gratitude on this journey. And with that, I'll turn it over to you. Mm. Ah. <laughs> uh, my heart's pounding. Thank I, you. I wanted to surprise you. Yeah, you did. You did. So thank you. Um, yes, uh, Greg has been a fabulous co-lead, friend, and um, and role model for me um, through through this journey. Uh, we've been working together on the third cohort of the Fulbright Arctic Initiative now for three years, and um, and every day has been um, a, a wonderful surprise in good and 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 surprising ways. So thank you. Um, so the Fulbright Arctic Initiative can't happen um, without the, the work and the partnership and the collaboration of many, many people. And for those of you that live and work in the Arctic and um, are passionately um, committed to the people in the places of the Arctic, know that partnerships and relationships are the foundation of everything we do. So I'm um, going to take some time here to acknowledge the many, many um, people and institutions that have helped us along the way for this during this third cohort. I, I'd like to start with the um, Fulbright Commission's in Denmark, Finland, Norway, Sweden, as well as the IIE Moscow, Russia office. I'd like to give a particular thanks to Fulbright Canada and Fulbright Iceland because they stepped up and hosted um, our, our cohort for um, the first in-person meeting in Iceland, which happened a year into um, our, our work together. And then um, in Canada, the Fulbright Commission hosted um, our second in-person meeting. I'd also like to thank and acknowledge the Bureau of Education and Cultural Affairs with the U.S. State Department. They're the, the U.S. Um, State Department division that, that oversees Fulbright and works with us on the Fulbright Arctic Initiative. In particular, I'd like to acknowledge Mary Kirk and Steve Money and Cecilia kuczynski Mulder. Um, without the three of them, we would not be here today and we're, we're very um, grateful for their support and belief in our program. I'd also like to thank the Institute for International Education and Susan Mundell, who um, has, who is a, a logistic goddess and helps us with all things logistical, technical, and paperworky. Um, and <laughs> and without her, we would all be train wrecks. So um, so thank you, Susan. Uh, I would also like to acknowledge when we were in Canada, we had a wonderful opportunity to go into the Northwest Territories, um, and we were graciously hosted by the Gwich'in Tribal Council, the Inuvialit Regional Corporation, the Community of Inuvik, the Aklavik Indian Band, and the Editat e Council. Um, they hosted us for uh, about four days, and we had a very wonderful experience with them. I'd also like to thank the Woodrow Wilson Center Polar Inst Institute. Um, Jack Durkee is also a fabulous technology person, <laughs> and so we're, we're super uh, excited for him. And then, of course, Rebecca Pincus, who is just lovely and gracious and brilliant, and we're just so happy she's the new director <laughs> of the Polar Institute, although we miss Mike. We miss Mike. <laughs> Um, so, so thank you everyone for being here. Um, we, I also just want to acknowledge all and thank all of our wonderful scholars as well as their families for, um, for all the great work they did over the past, um, two years and their families for supporting them through all of that. So thank you. Perfect. It's uh, our distinct pleasure to introduce our keynote uh, speaker today, Mike Sraga. Mike, as anyone in this room will know, and many of the people who are, uh, the hundreds literally, that are uh, tuned in today online, 
Uh, Mike is one of those people where you absolutely could say this is a person that no, needs no further introduction. Everyone knows Mike. But not everyone online may, and I think it, we owe it to him. Highlight a, a couple of notable things. Obviously, as Rebecca pointed out, one of the co-founders and co-leads of the Fulbright Arctic Initiative, a founding director of the Polar Institute here at the uh, Wood, uh, Woodrow Wilson Center, uh, chair of the U.S. Arctic Research uh, Commission, and uh, nominee, of course, as the United States Ambassador to the Arctic. But I wanted to take a moment that many of you who know Mike um, and paint another picture uh, metaphorically and uh, really about Mike. Uh, Mike Sfraga. Sfraga. Something I learned in 2015 talking to Mike uh, is Italian, his origins, uh, for a brushstroke, a brushstroke on a painting. And Mike has been maybe our most important artist of all in the Arctic region. And you think the delicacy of a paint stroke to capture feelings, emotions, values, places. An artist can capture things that a photographer cannot. An artist can capture both the seen and the unseen and emote, inspire, lift, and embrace. Mike, you have done that with so many people, whether it's on the streets of Fairbanks, or in the halls of Washington, D.C., or at Arctic Council meetings. You have been a friend to all. Like a good artist, you've seen into the hearts and souls of places, communities, and people you inspire and bring out the very best in each of us. You continue to paint a tapestry of the Arctic, its people and places, and why this is so important to global humanity. And that, we thank you. And with that, I invite you to be our <laughs> keynote speaker. <laughs> So, so I just want to say that that's how Greg gets away with his humor, is that one day, yesterday, uh, you know, there was eyes and d darting around the room when uh, <laughs> Mike or when Greg introduced Mike, but today he makes up for it with that very wonderful introduction. So, um, so th this is how Greg gets away with his humor. <laughs> I just don't know what to do with that. <laughs> Thank you, Greg and Beth. I really don't know what to do with that. A Sicilian without words. <laughs> Mark it down in your calendar. I really wish my partner, Ross Virginia, were here. He's up in Dartmouth right now, no doubt, watching. Uh, because Greg, if, if uh, I've been part of a, a portrait for the Arctic, you, you know who the co-artist has been, and that's been Ross, Virginia. Um, let me say to you that when you start something like the Fulbright Arctic Initiative, you have an idea. When you start a Polar Institute, you have an idea. And you get put into a box of a founder, whatever that might be. But in any position, when you leave, at least I think so, when you leave, you want to leave whatever you have helped to build, along with many, many others, you want to leave it in, in fairly good shape. You want it to at least aspire to the mission you set out, and you surely want your, the next team that takes over for you to be better than you. You want them to be better than you, because you cared about what you created, or else you wouldn't have created it, and you want it to be better, whatever that means, even if it means deconstructing and rebuilding. That certainly has happened here at the Polar Institute with Rebecca now being, being the director of the Polar Institute. You always want somebody to be better so that whatever you put into place becomes better. I think it certainly is the case here with um, Beth and with Greg that whatever Ross and I envisioned, along with 
IIE, along with the Fulbright program, along with state, along with the um, country directors and commissions that comprise our efforts in the North. And, and by the way, you need to underscore that because they already run Fulbrights. And then we came in with this new idea and they embraced us and they simply didn't have to, but they did. But when you put all that together, you want it to grow and you want the next leaders to be better. And I think like we got the Polar Institute right with Dr. Pincus, we got the Fulbright right by picking two alums who are of the program, who feel the program, who come from the DNA and, and understand it, but they are of the North. And when you are of the North, it's just different. It's not just an academic exercise. So Greg, Beth, thank you for making whatever vision Ross and I had, along with all of the people that worked on it, just better, because it does start at the top. Thank you, and congratulations. There's 400,000 plus Fulbright scholars. I think that, that number is kind of right, over 4,000. There's almost 60 now Fulbright Arctic Initiative alums. It doesn't match the 400,000, but you've got to start someplace. <laughs> but it started with 16 and a vision. And the vision was not about another academic exercise. It had two routes. One was to create a program that complemented the U.S. efforts during the chair, their chairmanship of the Arctic Council. And the second was to bring together the best and brightest of the North to address the issues of the North, not in an academic paper. Yes, in research documents, yes, in research papers, yes, in portfolios of policy, but they had to be actionable because the North simply can't wait. So we created something with a sense of urgency, it had purpose, but it needed to serve the people of the North. And that's where it all started. In fact, it started with a phone call from Ambassador Mark Brzezinski, and at that time, the chair of the Fulbright Board, Tom Healy. And they had thought about what to do during the Arctic Council, a chairship at the Arctic Council, and Ross and I had about 36 hours to write a concept because it needed to get to the Department of State for some decision making. And Ross in Vermont and me in Fairbanks wrote in 36 hours what you all have built and you've all made better. It was an idea, scholars from all eight nations working together, but independently. Have your own Fulbright, then work within teams and look at how those teams can work yet in a third concentric ring of how it all impacts your inner ring. So your own Fulbright, then in a group, and then how the groups all create a Venn diagram of effort, because that really is the North. It's not just about a discipline. It must, be inter it must be interdisciplinary. It must be multidisciplinary. You can't solve the problems uh, that, and challenges and opportunities off the grid in Northern Canada if you're just an economist. You, by the way, also need an artist. You need an engineer. You need a biologist. And so that's how we visioned the North. Interdisciplinary, sense of urgency, purposeful policy that can be scaled up or scaled down. When I read your policy papers that you have created in this third Fulbright, you can scale them up and you can scale them down. You may not know this, I said a little bit of this yesterday, but what you write and what you have provided through your expertise, your engagement with communities, it means something but it does something, which to me is better than means something. It does something. Your presentation, the first presentation panel yesterday at the embassy, the Norwegian embassy, I watched folks focus on what you said, which is a result of what you did. And I watched very, very senior experts take notes, listen, confer kind of quietly sometimes, a little louder some other times, but that's a good thing. You made wonderful experts who do this for a living think about what you have been doing and what you have done and how to put into action what you said. It's very different than just writing a paper. That happened yesterday. It's going to happen again today. It's going to happen again today. Ross and I watched this in the first Fulbright when it was simply an idea, just, just an idea. In fact, scholars had much to do with creating what we did than, than Ross and I. We changed mid-course, multiple course, we recoursed, we uncoursed, did a lot of coursing. 
It's because we listened to communities, we listened to scholars, and we constantly had to reiterate where we were trying to go because the North doesn't stand still. So we watched the first Fulbright folks create a bunch of policy papers, and as Greg noted yesterday, there's legacy here. And to me, legacy is excellence over time. That's how I view legacy, excellence over time. So even today, the first Fulbrighters, they're still working together, writing proposals together, consulting together. They're doing the work of the North because we brought them together. They'd be doing it anyway, but they're doing it in those concentric rings. Second Fulbright, same way, doing things of the North for the North, and they built the team. It is clear from this document and just watching body language that the third Fulbright will have the same energy and synergies going forward. I would argue that what you have built in some ways is built on the former Fulbrights, but you've gone through a very different time. You are influenced by some very different things, right? <laughs> You're influenced by a pandemic that almost shut down a globe, that changed lives, that changed communities. I said yesterday that, um, for a number of different examples, but I'll use broadband for a moment. We always in the Arctic have put a spotlight on the needs of the northern communities to have better broadband, better access, so that's telemedicine, telehealth, you know, just life like everyone else has. Well, we try to put a spotlight on that. COVID, COVID put a heat lamp on it, what we don't have, what it really costs communities. The fact that families had to pay four to $500 a month just to get an internet connection in some places and then wait a half hour for, for, for a PDF to download. That's interesting and it's challenging, but when you need health information now because your community is undergoing a pandemic and you don't have, you have but one nurse clinic, one nurse in a clinic, that's a problem. And so you have lived through that real life experience. Try to separate yourself six feet when you have three generations living in one home. Okay? It might be easy for some of us, but sure not easy for people living in many places in the North and elsewhere in the world. So you've gone through a pandemic you've gone through a realization that our planet is heating so fast that we still don't quite understand how fast and we don't yet quite know what these implications are for next week, next month, or next year. We can run models, but they're all wrong. Some are really helpful, but we're still grappling with that. And you layer on that the new security dimensions in the North, including environmental security. Think about energy security economic security. I would argue there's something called research security, making sure that we have enough research dollars and research effort and the capacity and the infrastructure to do the good work, whether you're in economics or, whether, or in physics. So you're, you're living through a very dynamic phase here. I would argue that if we didn't have a pandemic, the resulting challenges, we have a ground war in Europe, we have energy crisis, that is making us quickly think more about and investing more in a transition, there's this ripple effect, and you've had to do this in real time. We didn't have those challenges like this in Fulbright 1 and 2, but that's the beauty of this Fulbright and the other Fulbrights, is that you can revisit, rework, revitalize, and do the good work, in this case, for the North. I would also say that I think this program fits well with the DNA of Fulbright. This is the United States reaching out and inviting countries to come in. Different perspectives, in this case, on the North. And we've become a globalized North, right? We're no longer that place over there somewhere, right? We are integrated. It's done. Whether you're thinking about fisheries or trade or our languages or tourism, we're now all interconnected. So you have been working for the last, has it been three years? For the last three years, right? More or less? About two? You've been working between two and three years <laughs> through a very dynamic time. But I'd argue that it's going to be even more dynamic just because of the realities that we live through and we're going to live through. Okay, that sounds dour and dark, and it's not. Because what you have provided in your policy briefs are really wonderful pathways to dealing with change that's coming whether it's political or environmental or economic, whatever that is, you're providing us pathways to actually deal with and maybe take advantage of where it's appropriate and right what the future holds for us in the North.
you're also raising the awareness of the North, how important it is to the rest of the globe. And you're doing it in a way that I can tie to a number of different things that are currently happening. One, because I am the chair of the U.S. Arctic Research Commission, I have to put adjacent to each other your policy brief of 2023 and the Research Commission's goals for 23-24. We are an independent federal agency, seven presidentially selected commissioners. Our job is to help set the course for U.S. Arctic research for the next two years. And it goes in two-year cycles. Seven commissioners, five Alaskans, four women, three Alaskan Native women. The lens through which we have done our work for the United States is impacted by who we are and where we come from, this lived experience. Five of seven are Alaskans. If I were to take our five goals, which I did, and overlap them on your policy brief, which I did, I think we both got it right. I think we both got it right. We talk about health and well-being. We talk about economic development and research. We talk about natural hazards. Uh, we talk about uh, international cooperation. Talk about health and well-being, maternal health, communities' needs, community health writ large. We did this for the United States and our partners. And then here comes along your brief that you've been working on apparently between two and three years. <laughs> and I can do, and I did, a layover. So if you don't think these do not have impact, they do. Because these two in my portfolio now come together. And that's the power of the Fulbright. It's not just an academic exercise. I know you got a lot out of it. But it's when somebody like me and others can take what you have done and look at what we're doing and say, this actually informs and advances what I'm doing here. That, to me, is the magic of this Fulbright. And I can tell you, you have done it. So thank you for doing that. You've taken a little work off our desk. <laughs> but if I'm telling you this from my perspective, from a US perspective, not just seven other nations are going to do that, but any nation who cares about the Arctic is going to look at this policy brief. And if they're good, and if they're smart, they're going to do the same thing. They're going to take what you did, and they're going to incorporate it into their work. That's the magic of the Fulbright. That was the vision Ross and I had. Actionable work by some of the brightest on the planet. I think we got that right. I think we selected two wonderful co-leads in Beth and Greg. And there's nothing better than somebody like me and Ross watching online to watch what has happened to an idea that started with a phone call, 36 hours of some kind of paper, that became a Fulbright that's now been institutionalized. So thank you for your work. Thank you for your leadership. And open your arms to what lies ahead in the next year because you will not go away from each other. This network will stay, and we benefit from it. Thank you. Mike, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Can I get my water back? Yeah. <laughs> oh, this one. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Mike, you, you've always been there to, uh, to support each and every one of us uh, trying to achieve these objectives. And we know uh, coming up uh, next week, uh, as you're hearing, on uh, May 4th, and all of us in this room, all of us on this line, uh, viewing this today, and the family around the Arctic Circle, know that you have our support. Uh, we have, as you have had our backs, we have yours. And uh, on May the 4th, may the 4th be with you. <laughs> yeah. No, I have to introduce uh, <laughs> our panel. So I invite the panelists to come up. What we're going to have uh, very shortly is 
an overview of the work of the three areas of the policy briefs outlined in health infrastructure and uh, uh, security. And uh, before going into that, what I'd briefly like to do is introduce our moderator, who is one of our Fulbrighters in this uh, cohort, uh, Susie Crate. And uh, it is a, a real pleasure for me personally uh, to introduce Susie. Uh, Susie, uh, during the Fulbright period, uh, became a Professor Emeritus George Mason University after an incredibly distinguished uh, career. And she was one of the two U U.S. scholars that were going to be a first to go to uh, Russia uh, on the Fulbright Arctic Initiative, but of course as world events inter intervened. And for those of you who don't work in the area of Russian and Indigenous peoples or anthropology, uh, and please know that Susie Crate is one of the pioneers, if not the pioneer, in, in work with Indigenous peoples and communities in eastern Siberia going back to just after when the Berlin Wall came down in the 90s and was legendary. She's fluent in Sakha, she's fluent in Russian, and has had an enormous impact on the rest of us who have followed on her coattails in work in working in the Russian North. What was magical, magi magical about uh, what happened in this period is our work in Canada. Uh, Susie quickly uh, pivoted because couldn't go to Russia, but the work she's doing with communities in permafrost, her and her colleague you'll hear later, Lena Popova from Yakutia, gave an amazing presentation in the community of Aklavik a Gwich and a New Yellowit uh, community and engage one of the most enriching community discussions about the impact of permafrost in real time, in real places, in real communities. And with, uh, and, and frankly, just hit it out of the park. Um, it was really, really important, especially the cultural diplomacy mission uh, and actionable items that Mike talked about in his talk. So without further ado, Susie, I'll let you take it away. <laughs> well, to quote someone else, I don't know what to do with that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Greg. That was very generous. I appreciate that. And of course, I'd like to start by expressing my deepest gratitude, and I'm sure the gratitude of my other 18 peer researchers for everything that's gone on in this two or three year period. <laughs> it has been sort of a time warp, I must admit, with all the changes. So I'll begin by saying good afternoon. My name is Susie Crate, Professor Emeritus of Anthropology at George Mason University. And over the course of our two year Fulbright Arctic Initiative three fellowships, we each collaborated in one of three themed interdisciplinary groups security, health, or infrastructure to come up with policy recommendations. And in this panel, we will highlight the policy brief key points and there are QR codes and access to the fuller policy briefs if any of you are interested in those. I will first introduce, e I will first introduce each panelist after which each will provide an overview of their team's policy brief and then we will open it to Q&A. And I was asked to let the people online know that if you have questions, if you could please direct them to polar at wilsoncenter.org. So online community, if you have questions for the panel, polar at wilsoncenter.org. And I'd like to ask everyone to be thinking of challenging questions. I'd like you to stump my my colleagues here. <laughs> I don't think you can. <clears throat> to my immediate left is Celia Baura Omerstotter, Professor of International Affairs at the University of Iceland. Beside her is Jessica Grebel, Professor of Russian and Eurasian Studies at Colgate, Colgate University. And last but not least, Anna Kurok Reikala, Associate Professor of Energy Engineering at Lulio University of Technology. So I give the floor to Celia. Thank you, Susie, uh, especially. Oops, I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> oh. 
especially for the uh, challenge to, to stump us, so that'll be fun. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being with us both here in the room and online. Uh, I want to start by expressing my thanks to the Fulbright uh, in general and the Fulbright Arctic Initiative for the opportunity to be here, engaged with his cohort over uh, the two years of uh, very strange long online meetings and, uh, and very uh, long awaited in-person meetings that we've had now three over uh, in, in just under a year. Um, and of course my group on uh, security uh, and cooperation in the Arctic. My group is in Icelandic alphabetical order by first name, uh, Andreas, Chris, Lena, Peter, Rauna, and Susie. And uh, up here on the screen, you'll see uh, our backgrounds, which I hope you can see is uh, quite interdisciplinary. Uh, being tasked, and I think that's one of the elements of, of the Fulbright Arctic Initiative, is being tasked with working with people who don't necessarily share uh, your academic training, uh, your indoctrination, uh, or your scientific methods. And that has been a challenge and, uh, and a great opportunity to expand our knowledge and understanding. Um, we met a few times online, uh, in addition to our, our uh, cohort meetings, to talk about what it was that we wanted to do. And uh, we found that our understandings of security were very different. Um, and uh, that led us to conclude that we needed to talk about the interconnectedness of all these different ideas and how they, uh, how they relate. Then we had to think about how we could make that into policy actionable, uh, deliverable, the policy brief that is available to you here outside. And that led to another extended round of discussions. And as we all know, security, and in particular national security, is an opaque process. Um, it's very secretive in general. Uh, it's the most uh, male-dominated aspect of uh, national or foreign security, uh, foreign and security policies. And it's usually also just made in the, se in the centers of any state. It's not something that is uh, dealt with and processed, created uh, at the margins. And that led us to think about how we could, because we are uh, all, uh, either we work in or come from these marginalized regions, how we could bring the voices and challenges and hopes of those regions into the national policy uh, process. We talked about the impact of permafrost on, uh, uh, on the residents of Saha. Uh, we talked about how nuclear submarines in Tromsø, uh, northern Norway, were impacting the community when children started to be given uh, iodine to, uh, uh, to counteract possible radiation, and how that creates a sense of being um, uh, marginalized and ignored even by your, uh, by your uh, national governments. So we thought, how can we take national security policy, the reasoning and the intent behind them, uh, and communicate them to these uh, marginalized populations in the Arctic? The, as I said, the national governments are often located far away from the communities that are directly affected uh, by the decisions that are taken about security. Uh, but we also wanted to think about how we can take these, uh, the ideas of those communities and communicate them to these national, regional uh, governments and local governments. So that's where we set out from, uh, and how to do this. Uh, we decided that we would uh, organize town halls, uh, consultative forums in the areas that we're uh, either living in, working in, or visiting. And uh, now on the screen, you'll see the picture from our, uh, from our policy brief that indicates where we had these meetings. There were a total of eight, and uh, I think we got a fairly uh, complete circumpolar coverage, even though they were, uh, we could, of course, would have wanted to have more. Um, and the conversations were very different. Uh, they focused on the economic and environmental impact of the military presence in Iceland, uh, the expansion of a runway in Inuvik, uh, the impact of permafrost in Tirin and in Aklavik, the dialogue between the local community in Longyearbyen in Svalbard, uh, and the government in Oslo uh, in light of the war in Ukraine, the need for a more formal inclusion of local concerns in Trumsa and uh, national security policy, dual use aspects of military installations and activities in Nuuk, uh, the uh, impact of both Danish and uh, US militaries in Greenland, uh, to the need for early and ongoing communications to implement policy in Anchorage. From these very different conversations, we developed um, rather specific policy recommendations uh, based on the findings to help formal policymakers co-create policy with Arctic communities. 
So the question then is, how do you do that? How do you co-create policy with Arctic communities? And we identified six different steps or ways to do this. First is, how, who do you include? Um, we, uh, we, we say you need to identify the relevant rights and stakeholders, both inside and outside communities affected by the policies and decision and questions. And then, of course, what is the issue? Um, identify the core issues and questions through community hearings or conversations. And our big find, I think, is do not assume that you know in advance what the issues are. Mm -hmm. Because we came in with all sorts of ideas that this would be what people wanted to talk about and you know, from we knew, what we knew from research and, uh, and political decisions. And we often saw something else. When do you do this? Uh, one of our groups said, you know, this sounded very simplistic, but then it turns out that it's very important. <laughs> and he's laughing at me now. Um, you know, we had a, a, a great, uh, great example of, um, you know, uh, the, uh, the, the, Thule, the renaming of the Thule Air Base uh, was scheduled during Easter, in, which is a long holiday in all the Nordic countries, including Greenland. So the U.S. made a big snafu there. Um, <laughs> So do not assume that you know, you know, take into, into uh, consideration seasonal activities, whether it's harvesting, hunting, fishing, or official holidays. Um, and do not assume that, you know, your time schedule is, is the same as the community that you're interacting with. How do you communicate? Sometimes you may need to take into consideration that interpretation is needed, but also take advantage of any existing communication modes or networks and communities. It can be a Facebook group. Uh, but it can be a bulletin board in the local grocery. Um, and then the big, big ask is, how do you co-create? Uh, it's absolutely essential to work collaboratively to draft the policy and develop implementation and monitoring plans to reflect the security needs of all rights and stakeholders. Include community members in reviewing the, the policy while it is being drafted. And don't forget to schedule follow-ups. Determine the schedule and the process, who will share what, when, where, with whom, and how will community feedback be incorporated into that ongoing policy making. We found that, uh, that, that this level of uh, community, eng community engagement would benefit security policy creation for both formal decision makers and for Arctic, local Arctic communities. For example, by building better long-term communication channels between decision makers and Arctic communities. Better aligning goals and priorities of all parties uh, more equi equi equitably uh, increasing, uh, involving all relevant knowledge systems, whether they be indigenous, local, or scientific, uh, or all of these. Um, increase community resilience and security, and ultimately enable more effective implementation of national security policies. And to sum it up, our recommendation to policymakers is to include all relevant forms of security, such as food, environmental, energy, gender, health, economic and cultural security when developing security policies through active and meaningful engagement with Arctic communities. Thank you. And now Jessica will tell us about the health group. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Crate. Good afternoon. I would like to first and foremost acknowledge my collaborators, Bonita, Yelena, Kettel, Rainer and Anu, um, listed of course on the slide here, just as it was in the last one in terms of our different uh, places where we reside around the Arctic and in the US and our, um, our expertise. Today I will do my best to represent our collective thoughts about increasing health and well-being for all Arctic communities. As a team of natural and social scientists, public health professionals, and an architect, our challenge was to develop a collective understanding of what a non-clinical, non-epidemiological, and inclusive approach to health and well-being could be for the diversity of people who call the Arctic home. From the beginning, we aim to consider the needs and desires of indigenous communities, especially those of youth and elders. As we continued to work, we also recognized that newcomers to the Arctic also have needs and desires for health and well-being. As our two to three years of teamwork continued, um, it became increasingly important that we, we must also consider the needs of the newest newcomers to the Arctic, asylum seekers and refugees. As good collaborators do, we spent time agreeing and disagreeing and inching and leaping towards common ground. 
And we found that common ground by recognizing that in order to address the health and well-being of youth, elders, indigenous communities, and newcomers, we would need to recognize and approach the European, North American, and Eurasian Arctics as diverse and heterogeneous, where a one-size-fits-all approach can only be a long-term approach and dream thus far. So diversity and inclusion have become central to us in our policy recommendations towards equity in health and well-being in the Arctic. Beyond the obvious focal components of concern that we've heard a little bit about here today, such as mitigating climate change and continuing to empower indigenous communities, we advocate for a multi-pronged approach to address six foci, noted here on our slide, thank you, Dr. Crate, that integrate these concerns with others related to health and well-being. You can read about all of them in our policy brief, but today I'm going to highlight three. First, engage the diversity within and among Arctic communities. This means attending, first and foremost, to the health and well-being of indigenous communities. But we must also consider the needs and desires of newcomers, including the newest members, asylum seekers and refugees, from multiple countries. We must collectively develop best practices to address multiple demographic groups. Second, create the social infrastructural capacity to address the mental health concerns of everyone within any community. For example, train new generations of health professionals capable of communicating in local and indigenous languages who respect and know how to integrate traditional and other knowledges into health and medical practices. Understand that addressing mental health is not stigmatic, but a necessity in a rapidly and continually, tra continually transforming cultural, socioeconomic, and environmental setting such as the Arctic. Third, plan and construct infrastructure that is culturally and environmentally appropriate for youth, elders, newcomers, and indigenous peoples in these communities. Include local and indigenous participation from the very beginning. Stand with indigenous communities to ensure continued rights and uh, that uh, continued rights and access to land, an immeasurably important aspect of health and well-being that recognizes the human animal environment nexus. Build health facilities that incorporate spaces for the spiritual and medical needs and desires of all Arctic residents. These three recommendations and examples and more are found in our policy brief. We hope that this brief may be built upon to become a guiding path for continued community-oriented and culturally responsive development of health and well-being in the Arctic. Thank you, Dr. Graybill. And now, Anna, thank you. So thank you. So I have the honor to represent the infrastructure group. And I first want to thank you, all my co-workers, so Andrea, Chris, Jamie, Lil, and Siga. And like the rest of us, the other groups, we are a diverse group in terms of expertise, nationalities, as well as where we are in our career. And common, but common for all of us is the passion for the Arctic and the experience of living and working in the sub-Arctic regions. And like has been mentioned a bit, like all, there is not, all, all countries are different. So the Arctic parts of the countries are very different between the different countries. And as I said also, we have different expertise in my group and in another group. So what I will say today, I will not be able to capture all the nuances, but I will be a bit talking now from my perspective. So I'm living and working in the biggest town in northern Sweden and in a region where the green transition is happening right now and is going in a rapid speed. So that means we need the infrastructure especially is kind of we need to take a lot of decisions and they will have an impact for the long in, in, in decades. So our group was assigned the topic of infrastructure. 
And it turned out that we had very different ideas on what was the most important infrastructure to focus on. For some regions, permafrost was a really big issue, but for others, we don't have permafrost. So that one was not a topic in our countries. But common for all of us was that all our home regions had to deal with a changing climate. And as well as the transition to access to affordable and clean energy. And common for all of us was also that we all saw an increased interest in the Arctic regions from our governments. And the governments was typically, with one exception, located in the southern part of our countries. And the exception is Iceland, where you are in the middle. And that has a bit, before we have been, the regions have been, been, treat, been by themselves a bit. But now all the focus and the lights were put on the Arctic regions. And not only from the governments, but also from the industries. So the industry, both the, the, the governments and the in, new industries saw that they could use, in a way, the Arctic regions to decrease their impacts on climate change. Because I think, uh, as most of us in this room knows, that all the Arctic regions are rich in resources, and especially renewable resources that are needed for electrification of many industries, both directly or through hydrogen. And many of those industries are therefore establishing in the Arctic regions. And when I talk about those industries in my region, when I go and talk with them, it can be also good to know what are their worries and so on. And when I ask them, like, what do you need in order to be able to, for example, produce fossil-free steel? And I think a lot of us will then think, oh, we need energy. We need clean energy. But what they are saying, all of them, are actually, we need su sustainable societies. Because they want people to be able to work for them. So they need the people as well. So they have an interest also to work towards sustainable societies and so on. Let's see. And so where am I going with this one? <laughs> OK, now I'm lingering a bit. <laughs> so our group had a lot of discussions about this infrastructure and the needs and the soci societies and so on. And we saw that the infrastructure is a lot of different things, and it's more than just the built environment. And we saw that infrastructure needed to change in some of the regions. And this transition was all, a lot of the time labeled green transition. At, at the same time, we saw that the concept green transitions didn't have a clear definition, and that it mainly was used by the industry and from a very top-down perspective. So when we were discussing back and forwards, we wanted to understand a bit more on how the Arctic communities was included when planning for this new green transition. Is the industry just talking about sustainable society? Do they mean it? And so on. So in our policy brief, we haven't provided specific solutions when this is actually not up to us to decide in our group. And it's not up to the people in this room to decide, it's up to the communities to decide. But what we do recommend is to have a more holistic approach when planning for this new infrastructure in the Arctic. And the reason for this is that infrastructure are complex socio-technical systems, and they shape our living conditions. And they stay there for decades. And it's difficult and timely and expensive to change them afterwards. So what we put there, we will have for a long time. And we in the academia, in my field, we call it a path dependency. So we need to be careful to not walk into a system and infrastructure that we cannot change in the future to another direction. But how do we do this? So now we are, let's see, yeah, now we are building a lot of new infrastructure, and we need to make sure that this new infrastructure are designed to support the social needs of the communities and not the other way around. And this brings me to our first real policy recommendation, and that is the one on infrastructure 
and then we recommend to that we really need to focus on supporting the community needs for sustainable so solutions that en enables future development in the communities. And this means both to facilitate renewable energy supply solutions and storage, as well as sustainable buildings and transportation system that interact with and are a part of the comprehensive energy system. So when we plan for energy, it's not just for those big industries or in the new industries. We also make, need to make sure that the communities have what they need. And in order to get those infrastructure in place, there is a need for policy infrastructure. And that this is aligned with the priorities of the communities and not only of the industries. And the policies on our different, they need to be put on different levels and they need to be able to uh, change and adjust quickly in order to consider new conditions that come up in the Arctic. Because we are moving kind of fast now. So then we also need to have the policy in place there that can kind of adapt. So now I have been talking about the importance a bit of considering the needs of communities, their conditions, and their priorities. priorities. But how do we do this? The Arctic communities have tons of knowledge, but they do not have all the expertise that is needed for this. And they don't know exactly all the options that they may have. So there is a need, and that is our final recommendation. There is a need for some kind of knowledge infrastructure. And with that, we mean an infrastructure that can empower local people with knowledge about both the benefits and the drawbacks of different choices so that they know what they are choosing between. And also to be able, yeah, so they know that they are choosing between. And one such example would be, for example, to create platforms where cultural leaders, civilians, and all kind of expertise can meet and exchange ideas. And when talking about experts, this brings me to my last point. And now we, I think we have some policymakers here and some policymakers on the online, I hope. And with the expertise, I would say that expertise is not necessar necessary coming from the south. So keep, there is a lot of expertise in the north. So make sure to, for example, put funding into the university in the north to kind of empower them as well. And hire local architects and experts when designing the new cities or, or communities. Because they are living the life already and briefing the area in the region. And they are aware of the conditions, so use them. And with that, thank you. Thank you, Anna. So before we open to questions from the audience, I would like to ask one that perhaps is on many people's minds. Will each of you comment on how this process of developing these policy recommendations might have been different if Russia had not invaded the Ukraine in February of 2022? Please. Yeah. yeah, I think um, I mean, the obvious impact that it had on us, um, the two of you who could not go to Russia <laughs> for your field work, um, <laughs> um, you know, having to adapt, uh, shift focus, uh, shift the focus of your research, but also our two Russian colleagues who were for a short time sidelined while uh, decisions were being made here in the U.S. about uh, cooperation with individuals from Russia, and thankfully that was the decision was that person-to-person uh, -person cooperation was uh, uh, desirable, uh, so they they could return. That would have definitely impacted the quality of our work if they had not been here. Um, but in addition, I think um, having maybe, specifically having Russia as the chair of the Arctic Council during this period meant that the Arctic Council was, uh, for us, um, basically not operating. We uh, did not see uh, events take place, the decisions and, and conversations that were developing there uh, as we were doing our work. So we could not respond to these in the same sense that we would have um, if, if that had not been the case. 
And uh, maybe it also shifted our emphasis in the security group more to traditional security than it would have necessarily done otherwise. I think for almost all of us, the uh, possibility of, of us seeing uh, land war in Europe uh, was very remote, if not inconceivable, uh, a year and a half ago. Uh, and uh, uh, that means that we you know, have to take other things into consideration. And, and I see in, in uh, data that I'm collecting now in Iceland that you know, the uh, urgency of the climate crisis is maybe not as great, uh, and people are more concerned by uh, the proximity of, of uh, armed conflict. So, um, so I think it's, in many ways, it's affected uh, the work that we were doing. Mm -hmm. I've got three short answers. <laughs> so for some of my colleagues in the health and well-being group, uh, the pandemic and the ongoing concerns around COVID have had more of an impact than the Russian invasion. I think we can't forget that one too in terms of things, big things following on, on, on one after the other here. Our uh, Fulbright colleague from Russia would have been able to participate in this program with less distress um, had this invasion not happened. And that is certainly something we all wish could have been the case. Um, and for me personally, um, as you mentioned, um, Celia, I was unable to perform my original individual research program in Russia and needed to change my research direction midstream. And while, and Dr. Pelzer helped me understand and helped me feel better about this by mentioning, you know, when a window closes, a door opens or whatever that phrase is. Um, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm welcoming opening that door even further to think about what comes next. Well, you for, have a very generous host. That's right, that's right, for thinking about all of us. <laughs> there is that. There is that. Thinking about what window gets opened here um, in terms of what comes next. And that's going to be a long next for those of us studying um, Russia and associated regions. Thank you. Anna. Yeah, we, we didn't have any, anyone from Russia in our group or no, no one planning to ru visit Russia. But I think for us, we, green transition was not the first focus in our group. If we have, were talking, discussing a lot of different other things with infrastructure. But for us, I think the Russia invasion kind of urgent. So all the countries in Europe, they kind of got green transitions, got higher, higher up on their agenda. So I think that, that made us a bit to decide, was even more curious on this concept. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah. you. All right, I had another question, but I have a feeling there may be questions <laughs> from the audience. I see a lot of young people here. <laughs> and once a professor. <laughs> <laughs> I want to let you know, as I have let many students know, there are no stupid questions. <laughs> Only questions that other people want to know the answers to, but they're too shy to ask. Fabulous. Yes, sir, this young gentleman here. <laughs> I know. There's a microphone. I was coming. joking. <laughs> Hi, I'm John Farrell from the Arctic Research Commission. I have a question for Jessica. Uh, your diagram had yes. your recommendations around the outside, but Correct. can you give us policymakers something more to bite into beyond just saying mitigate climate change? Do right. you mean for people in the Arctic? Do you mean outside the Arctic? What specific thing? Because I haven't had a chance to read your your statement, but uh, <laughs> can you give us some more detail there? Absolutely. Um, and so when you will have a chance to read the brief, thinking about that mitigating climate change is, of course, something we should all be working towards. But from within the Arctic, um, both for people who live in the Arctic, who study the Arctic, so I'm including all of those folks when I'm saying this, um, we have some suggestions of short and long-term strategies. Um, and one that comes to mind right now, there's a project uh, currently underway, I think, from the University of Colorado Boulder, um, trying to understand changes to the ice sheet, which is more rapidly changing than we anticipated even one to two, three years ago. Um, and so monitoring that for the long-term understanding of what will come, um, and not only for the ice sheet, but for communities located next to it or a little further downstream as ice, mm -hmm. uh, ice regimes change. Um, so monitoring always seems like one of those, well, that's a no-brainer, we've got to monitor. Um, but, but we do absolutely need to monitor, but in an inclusive way where we're not just thinking about the physical environment, but we're also thinking about the social environments that are attached to it. 
But just to follow yep. up, how is that mitigating anything? You're just observing the decay of the So from, from observations, right, from that monitoring, we can start to think about what kinds of things, and this is not particular to Greenland, but what kinds of things might be coming out of permafrost regions or out of uh, melting ice, say zoonotic diseases, or diseases that may increase because of ice melt. Um, and what, can we, what information can we provide to health practitioners or other kinds of teams on the ground that need that to move forward? So it's monitoring plus then understanding what to do with that knowledge. Please, can I, I add one oh. John uh, Can we wait for the microphone? Wait for the mic, yeah. Microphone down here, please. Could we have a microphone? Oh, thank you. I thought it was coming from the back. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Sorry, John, John's, John was my former dean, so. Ah. <laughs> um, Please, yes. It was also a, a topic that intersects because it was how the climate change impacts environment that will impact health and safety. It's an infrastructure and a health question, so it was both that we really had in mind. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yep. Uh, thank you. I'm <clears throat> Sammy Young. Compared to John, um, my name is <laughs> between name two is and three. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Andreas Rasputnik. I'm a colleague of your Andreas at the uh, Andreas Estag from the Friedrich Nansen mm. Institute in Norway. Um, I have a question on. You all know. We all know that the Arctic is more and more debated also outside the Arctic. So I was wondering if, in your debates, uh, in your meetings, uh, in all your conversations you had, uh, if you also discussed on how your recommendations, your findings, could also inform policymakers outside the Mike Sraga bubble, you know, we all know what's <laughs> happening in the Arctic, you know, but do people outside the Arctic know what's happening? And have you also thought on how you, can you communicate your findings to people in Singapore? I think yesterday South Korea's president was here, you know, how, how mm -hmm. to reach those folks um, about yeah. uh, the future of the Arctic? Thank you. You were saying, go ahead. Uh, we, we didn't explicitly discuss that. We, were, we did have some conversations about the impact of this interest um, on the Arctic, but we didn't really talk about how these kinds of, of recommendations would, would reach um, those folks, I think. Susie, correct me if I'm misremembering something, because she's don't also think you're security misremembering, group. But I would, <laughs> from my own understanding, there has been increased interest and engagement in non Arctic countries mm -hmm. about. Um, the Arctic, especially, I think, um, I would say, because of climate change, uh, first and foremost. And I think that that interest and uh, desire to know more. Uh, I know in my own experience doing research in Saha, there's a huge number of Japanese researchers, a huge exchange between Japanese researchers and Saha researchers um, to understand climate change because Japanese people live very close to sea level. So there is, I think, an increasing understanding of our interconnectedness and the importance of, of the Arctic. Um, and I think increasing the understanding about climate change also leads to understandings. Our final resource frontier, it's called also, right? And so what will be happening with that, the opening of the Northern Sea Route and increased traffic. Uh, so I, I believe these policies can also be very applicable in other places. Yes. So a st a um, student. Sorry. <laughs> it's all good. Okay. Also yes. want you to know, students, that if you're aspiring to be in the Fulbright Arctic Initiative, <laughs> it, it will be to your benefit to ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> so on the topic of like the Northern Sea Route, I was curious, like being this international cross-country sort of research cooperative, I'm sure you're balancing a lot of like competing interests regarding the Arctic. Like I know that some countries are looking to take advantage of some mm. of the ways that climate change has accelerated melting. Mm -hmm. So what sort of compromises do you think that your research team had to make in terms of your policy mm. recommendations kind of to appease everybody? <laughs> well, I mean, do you, does anyone want to speak? I think that um, in terms of thinking about resources of, of all different kinds, human as well as natural, you know, whatever 
kind of naturally want to talk about here, mineral, biological, whatever it might be. Um, I think some of the concerns about which Arctic countries might want to mine, say more, or fish more, have been superseded by thinking about Russia's invasion of Ukraine, to be quite mm -hmm. frank. Um, and so an understanding of how that could be, that could come together or come apart in terms of interests of different countries in different parts of the Arctic and what they might do next um, is a question at this point uh, for us much more than a, how can we develop policy to address all eight nations. Mm -hmm. And I think we, we did really, uh, in my group at least, uh, represent our countries as such. So, uh, you know, I think we're fortunate to be in research environments where uh, we are, uh, our research is not dictated by national policy. So this did not um, come up as a, a point of contention. I think, yeah, t talking about energy, I think some, I mean, renewables is kind of like what the International Energy Agency and so on promote, but some countries are, it's also free for all different kinds of countries to choose their path. Mm. And we have different, talking about resources again, some have a lot of fossil fuels still, and their economy is based still on fossil fuels. So how fast that one is phased out could be one sensitive issue why you cannot go forward with with maybe what you, yeah, what some countries would maybe prefer. Mm -hmm. And I just also want to remind the scholars, the Arctic Initiative scholars who might have something else to add to these, please mm -hmm. chime in. I saw another hand back here. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, so I just had a interesting, uh, well, I think interesting. I guess <laughs> you will we'll be the judge of this. Uh, but I'm, I'm really interested in, you know, of course, Arctic nations and non-Arctic nations. Um, there are different legal codes, right, zoning regulations. And I think this has to do with um, all three of your policy briefs, right, talking about indigenous rights to nature um, or rights to land for health or zoning laws when it comes to uh, a green transition or national security. Of course, there's an inter interaction with law there. So I guess I'm interested in seeing uh, in, in how do you envision or did your policy groups think at all about how how is there an interaction here between U.S. law, Canadian law, you know, Russian law, all, all of these Arctic countries and Arctic nations? How how are you thinking about legal codes and changes that are going to be necessary in order to inspire health, improve uh, green energy transition, all all that kind of stuff? Well, I, I can just say off the top uh, that there among the eight different Arctic countries, there are vastly different rights in terms of indigenous rights. And I speak, you know, the reason I guess I jumped in there with that is because I've worked in Russia for 30 years and I'm very acutely aware of the difference of the uh, rights and lack of rights and sovereignty of Russian, Russia's indigenous peoples. Mm -hmm. And then I will pass it on. Uh, um, do you want to no, finish no, with that? No. Yeah. Uh, no. What I think we what we tried to do was uh, uh, find ways of sort of sidestepping uh, because if we had gone into like how Iceland does consultations on developing policy, you know, that would have been way too into the weeds for uh, you know for to to get a you know a policy recommendation across that could be appealing or applicable to uh, decision makers in in all eight countries. So even though each one of us maybe was thinking, okay, this we might run into a little bit of a trouble here, then we just tried to, you know, not fixate on on those issues. But it's definitely the the difference between, um, yeah, consultation, for example, how you how a government puts out a uh, proposed law, whether it does it or whether the decision making process is completely centralized. Um, you know, that can of course impact the way a policy develops. Um. I guess I'd, we had a very similar discussions about let's just not go there, <laughs> but, but mostly because it would not be feasible to come to the opportunities that we needed to think about in terms of developing policy recommendations. Mm -hmm. We've got a weight, we would have been weighed down in the weeds um, and possibly have run up against the challenges rather than the opportunities that we could possibly see. We also have bodies like the Arctic Council mm -hmm. that can assist. So I, I think our group didn't see it as a necessity to address law here. But it's a it's a great realm to be keep to continue thinking about. It was an interesting question. <laughs> <laughs> Something for the next cohort. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> 
way, way in the back. And then over here, this gentleman on the side. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Thank you so much for taking the time and sharing your research. One thing that I looked at in the policy brief was I didn't see as much statistics, and I'm personally interested in data myself. So I was just curious to know how has data kind of shaped your research or guided you throughout this process? Yep. Should I? Anything? I can. You, yeah, please. Yes. I think. Yeah, um, in, in the security group, we, we went, uh, we sort of took opportunity of the opportunities um, that were available. So sometimes it was engaging only in conversations, sometimes it was more in depth. Uh, and for the Iceland, if you, if you take a picture of the QR code in our brief, um, you'll get uh, sent to our uh, technical report, which gives a little bit more summary a uh, more detailed summary of each event. And in Iceland, I actually conducted a survey of the area around the uh, airport, which used to be uh, a US military base and continues to be a base e even if it's not permanently occupied by uh, the US military anymore. And sort of, so from there, I developed the questions that I wanted to have a conversation with uh, about with the population there. So, uh, so some there there is some of, of some quantitative data available, but most of our data in the security group was uh, qualitative. And I can add to that. Aren't we also mainly have qualitative data, and the reason is that we were a highly cross-disciplinary group. Mm -hmm. So there is very, and we had several. Uh, I think two, at least two of of you were working mainly on also qualitative. We have an artist, an art curator, and an anthropod. So, and I think going between the disciplinary, we need to do much more than just crushing data. So I think it's it's more about we, what we instead used a lot of time was was talking about words. <laughs> what do we mean with the word? When can you use which word, and and when can a word not be used, and so on? So I think that was the main data, and also to understand how different words are used differently. And I'll just add that for thinking about health and well-being, apples and oranges in terms of what's collected yeah. and understood and defined in different countries. Yeah. The gentleman on the side with the blue tie. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. Lil wants to add something. There's. Oh, thank you. Hi. <laughs> Even though I'm <laughs> the anthropologist in the group, I would say when it comes to, to the Arctic, there are tons of data. I mean, the, we have uh, data from the IPCC report. We have data from from the Arctic Council working groups. Um, there are, and when it comes to energy transition, there are also uh, yeah. tons of data in the European Union you can but extract and lots of knowledge. So, so if if you're looking for data, please just uh, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, go yeah, good. I mean, yeah, we. I mean, I as well. I work with energy statistics. So, I mean, there is a lot of data, but we didn't discuss them in our groups. So we are uh, ourselves are basing our research on on data, but that was not what was derived in the projects. Um, thank you all. Um, I'm really interested in your takes on how we can ensure that communities are really meaningfully invested in um, as we kind of walk this tightrope between the need for conservation in Arctic regions, but also the need to you know, develop critical resources mm -hmm. and even older forms of energy. Um, thank you. So wh what, what was the specific question? So how to do it or how to? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess just how to make sure that communities aren't left behind. Um, yeah. So th from, yeah. this is our recommendation is to include them in the discussion much more and to not be, I don't know, this w now I will talk from my perspective in Sweden, very much of the decisions are taken down in the south, in Stockholm, the capital. And a lot of experts are flying from the south up to, to wants to be a part of this transition. While it's actually happening a lot up there as well, but it's very difficult to get those voices out. And also when building new things, that they don't always take the expertise from there, up there, for the architects, for example, and designing cities and so on. But in term, you were asking a bit about the energy specific, how to get it going. I think what, what now it, it will be, it, I mean, it's very much to identify which kind of policies also will be in place. 
And the municipalities, at least in Sweden, are very much aware of what they need to do. And they are good at, they have a lot of also discussions with the citizens and so on. While I think it's mainly to, yeah, but then to be heard to the south, I think there you need, you need to acknowledge that there is a lot of competence up in the north. Mm. I think that is mm -hmm. my main, and also expertise and kind of like merge them and find platforms for this. Hi, I'm Andrea. Um, so my specialization is community-oriented renewable energy, and what I found in both my professional practice as an engineer and, and the scholarship is that we need to engage communities, but we also have to get, let them have um, a piece of that pie. That means we have to have mechanisms, financial mechanisms in place to empower people, particularly those uh, in, in remote and indigenous communities, so that the return on their investments goes back into their hands. It's a critical piece. So when we design policy, we need to ensure that there are um, not only local ownership requirements and any developments, but also that the return on the investment and those financial mechanisms go in there. And also the incentives that help really expensive, like $200 million projects get off the ground. That's really expensive for any community to do. So to maintain those um, community ownership proportions in the development of projects, you need to ensure that the equity isn't given up. And in order to do that, most developers who come in will trade equity and um, will say, well, now we'll pay for this, therefore we'll own it, and then we lose that community model. So it's very slippery slope and is quite dangerous. So we need to be protective by using really smart policy to ensure that that is done properly. I would add that overall, it's also sort of a um, decolonizing mentality where we don't come into places thinking we know what people need and also recognize the fact that these communities, many of these communities have been here for millennia in these in ecosystems, and that we can base what they do upon their adaptation and their flexibility in that environment, recognize that that environment is rapidly changing, one of the most rapidly changing environments on the planet, and be able to bring together uh, the best technology that we can with their their local understandings. Can I add one more thing? Yes, please. I can also say I, I've been working very much with energy scenarios and so on because there is a lot of different pathways we can take to meet the climate targets and how much of those climate mitigation should be in the north. And one of the ways, but, but thinking about the future and options is difficult and hard. And w on my individual per, uh, Fulbright exchange, I was at Arizona State University. And they are working very much with science fiction in order to imagine the future. Mm -hmm. So this is also what, we're, what I'm trying now again in, in, in the northern Sweden to see, to get to a way to kind of see the future and be able for people to imagine the future. So it's, and, and it's not about this like really different sci-fi. It's more about using the different technology and so on, but put it in the future and put the people in there as well in order to be able to discuss those different pathways that we have, which are difficult to grasp. So that's one way that one can be. What's our time like? Okay, let's have maybe two more. This, I don't, I'm not keeping track of whose hands were up first, so you, you okay, there you go. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I hear a lot about the challenges in the Arctic the changing landscape, and also the consequences and repercussions of these changes, whether on health or even on the social infrastructure of the communities that, are, that live up there. And the like, I'm kind of curious, um, mentioning also neo-colonialism, how we deal with reparations, and if that's a topic mm -hmm. that's at all discussed about. Um, it's a very difficult topic. I know that like in the international community, we've started to talk about reparations for climate change and the consequences of that. Um, so I'm kind of curious if you have any thoughts yeah. on how that should be or if. Or yeah. we'll start I would say yeah. that we did not talk about reparations for climate change in our, in our work on health and well-being, although, because I think where we are is still trying to understand 
exactly what the issues are for health and well-being as we can relate that to climate change. Now, it's not always relatable to climate change. There are other incredibly important things to consider the, in the Arctic, including pollution, um, path dependency of existing infrastructure mm -hmm. for many, uh, uh, built infrastructure for many. Mm -hmm. So there's many, many other considerations. Um, I know it's one of those sexy topics in the classroom, right? Re reparations for climate change, and we're not there yet, at least from my perspective. We need to understand more. In some cases, that's monitoring and understanding exactly what's happening on the landscape before we can start thinking about what mm -hmm. those reparations might be mm -hmm. for climate change specifically. Yeah. We didn't talk about reparations per se, but you know the the idea and the ideas of the colonial legacies are definitely uh, relevant for, to think about security as well. Um, how are people still marginalized? Uh, whose voices get heard? What languages are protected and are accepted when they are spoken? Um, you know, it's uh, uh, all all of these are colonial legacies that are just really important to recognize and. Uh, help to uh, combat, and um, I, I don't know whether reparations would be sufficient to uh, undo the damage that has been done. You know, some, some, in, in some sense, it would be they might be deserved, but will they be? Will will they restore equity uh, or uh, create equity if it's never been uh, in place before? I, I have a hard time imagining that being reached. So then it maybe becomes more of. Uh, uh, question of acknowledging the damage that has been done to various, um, mostly indigenous populations, local populations. Um, Maybe yes. I can just uh, talk about that too as well. And yes, I mean, please. if I'm Chris Clark McQueen, I'm uh, an indigenous person from the Northwest Territories, which is really far north. And <laughs> we um, actually, my First Nation is called the Hisuk -e Dane First Nation. And you know, it's been a very hard struggle about uh, these, these types of things and trying to uh, go through reconciliation, which is going at a very slow pace, but much slower here than in Canada. At least we have processes of reconciliation in Canada. I haven't seen that. I haven't looked enough into it here, but I haven't heard about that much. But, um, you know, for instance, we're just trying to take back different aspects of our culture and... We just, uh, my First Nation, which uh, the Thusilke Dane First Nation is, um, we just developed our own national park. And so it's, I think, the biggest national park in Canada, and we have some big national parks in Canada. And so we worked with the federal and territorial governments to, uh, you know, instigate it, plan it, um, and control it. So we have, you know, our people working alongside Parks Canada people and whatnot are all, you know, working together towards this goal of a sustainable land-based. And then, you know, then going from there, looking at sort of a land-based economy of, of tourism, ecotourism, and, you know, so trying to look at all these different types of things to do that, but that's a rarity. And so, you know, more of these things are coming out, but slowly, hopefully surely. Thank you, Chris. I, when I was in um, Inuvik for my individual research, I met a climate archaeologist, and his job was to go out to communities where artifacts, uh, burial sites were being exposed because of the thawing permafrost or coastal erosion, and working with the communities if they wanted him to preserve those pieces of their culture, he would. If they didn't, he wouldn't. So very different from in the past where there would be a collecting or, you know, the kind of precedence of preserving at whatever cost. Yes, Elena. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm Elena. I'm working on climate and human health. And uh, I would say that uh, according to my research, my results of my research, uh, uh, we are uh, facing not only uh, um, challenges of climate change, but we can uh, see uh, that uh, climate change uh, gives us some opportunities. 
uh, let's say, in terms of uh, a human perception of uh, changing environment, it's getting much warmer. Uh, that would mean uh, that uh, for tourists that are going to see this uh, very nice environment in northern areas, uh, it's uh, much warmer in the summertime uh, or in even in uh, transition seasons uh, to be there and uh, to feel uh, uh, to, to to look around and to. Uh, to, to be uh, happy with uh, all uh, those uh, uh, natural uh, environments in the, the north. Thank you. I'm afraid that my colleague Greg has given me the cane. <laughs> <laughs> so we must leave the stage, but we will be around for the break and afterwards. And we also want to remind you that there is an even better panel coming up next uh, of indigenous scholars. and. Uh, Please stick around and also our online audience, thank you for being there even though we can't see you. We know you're there. And uh, don't be shy to ask questions. We didn't get any from you before. So thank Please. you very much. Could be. Okay, everyone, thank you for that wonderful discussion with um, panel number one of our Fulbright Arctic Initiative scholars. And um, we're on to panel number two, which is, of course, um, Greg and I are totally biased. We're like proud parents. Um, <laughs> we have the second panel, um, which is a, indigenous, a panel of indigenous scholars um, that have participated in the Fulbright Arctic Initiative. And um, I just want to, as way of an introduction to this panel, the, um, the Arctic Research Plan of 2022 to 2026 that was developed last year by um, IARPIC, which um, we know the US government loves their acronyms, and IARPIC stands for the Interagency Arctic Research Policy Committee. Um, IARPIC developed this plan um, for the next four years that actually that prioritizes leadership of Arctic indigenous peoples and Arctic indigenous scholars and promotes the equitable inclusion of indigenous people and indigenous communities in research and policy development. Um, primarily and with a, with a very strong focus on prioritizing the self-determination and sovereignty of indigenous people in the Arctic. And we were very honored with the third cohort of the Fulbright Arctic Initiative to have five indigenous scholars um, representing um, their country and, and their people here in, the, in our, in our, fellow, in our uh, cohort. So um, the scholars are from Canada, Russia, Norway, and Finland, and you're gonna hear from each of them shortly. I get to introduce the moderator, <laughs> who is Dr. Kettle Leonard Hansen. And I, um, before I go into why Kettle is so famous now, before uh, Kettle was famous, <laughs> I actually had the opportunity to, and I first met Kettle uh, almost 20 years ago when we were both stranded in Kangarlusqua in an airport um, in Greenland um, for four days, and it was just Kettle and I and a German uh, rock band, and I think about four <laughs> other people were, were, were stranded in this airport for four days in Kangarlusqua on our way um, to Nunamed, which is a, which is a big uh, health conference in, in Greenland. So I've known Kettle for, for quite a long time, and when I did meet Kettle um, almost 20 years ago, he was, he was not... Um, he was on his way to being the wonderful scholar that he is now. He was still a PhD student. Um, so now he's Dr. Kettle Leonard Hansen, and he is an indigenous Sami scholar from Trumpsa. Uh, Kettle specializes in epidemiology and public health. He also serves as faculty at the Sami University of Applied Sciences. He has now um, been collaborating for over 20 years with indigenous Sami people conducting mixed methods studies um, on, on health with, with, Sami, with Sami people. And Kettle's individual um, exchange on the Fulbright Arctic Initiative was in Colorado at the University of Colorado where he studied 
uh, childhood trauma and looked at the differences between how indigenous peoples in the United States study and address childhood trauma and, and working and then comparing that to um, his communities in, in northern Norway. So I'm going to turn it over to Kettle um, and have fun, you guys. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, yeah, thank you, Elizabeth. And what happened in uh, Greenland? Stay in Greenland. <laughs> um, good afternoon to you all. I'm very glad to see so many people here today, and also to the people that uh, are following us online. And uh, I, if there is any question from the people that is online, it's possible to send the question to polar at wilsoncenter.org. And I will get that on my mobile phone after we have had um, the discussion. So I will be the moderator for uh, this panel today. And I have been so lucky to uh, be a part of this Fulbright Arctic Initiative for two years together with 18 other scholars that sit there in the hall. And, uh, but I've also been very grateful to uh, be together with uh, four other indigenous scholars. And uh, when uh, this Fulbright uh, Arctic Initiative started, there was uh, zero indigenous scholar. In the second wave, I think it was two. And uh, in this wave, it's five. And we know that 10% of the people that are living in Arctic are indigenous, so this is um, some, of, some of them. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. uh, so my job uh, today is to make sure that everybody is uh, ready for the reception. Uh, for so I will do my best to ensure that we are finished in uh, about uh, 42 minutes. So, so that's my job today. <laughs> so um, I'm first going to, to um, say something about these four other scholars, Lena, Rona, Bonita, and Chris. Um, Lena, uh, she comes from uh, Republic of Saha in uh, North um, East Siberia in Russia. And uh, she had been doing uh, research here in Canada, and she had been working with um, with Klima. Rona Kukkonen is a research professor of Arctic Indigenous Study at the University of Lapland in Finland. Her most recent book is a award-winning uh, book that is called Indigenous Self-Determination, Governance and Gender. That came out for four years ago, I think. And uh, she is a Sami woman from a Sami community up in North uh, Sweden. Finland. In Finland. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, it did, I, did I say Norway? <laughs> Sweden. 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 Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Could be anyway. Oh, sorry. Oh, that's yeah, right. yeah. Uh, very, very close <laughs> to the Norwegian happen. border. Yeah, so, on yeah, the yeah. Border. yeah. On the on the border, really. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Not border for us. No. No, that's true. Uh, so many people live in in um, in four countries, and it's uh, it's up me. We have no borders between us. Uh, Bonita Betty uh, is um, from Canada. Saskatchewan. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> and she is Cree Nation. Uh, she is uh, currently uh, the head of the Department of Indigenous Study at the university. Oh, Saskatchewan. That's true. He can say Saskatchewan. That's right. <laughs> 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 difficult word. I missed my cue. <laughs> I haven't learned that. I've been there two times, but it's difficult to, to say that word. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, her research has been about the uh, co uh, connection with Alaskan uh, community networking to uh, explore indigenous health, elders' care, and culture. Mm -hmm. uh, Chris uh, Clark McQueen is an indigenous 
uh, health architect from uh, Yellowknife. He have already told uh, you that he is a Dean First Nation. And uh, at the moment, he is traveling around in his truck with his two dogs <laughs> doing <laughs> his PhD. <laughs> Uh, and, and working with his dis dissertation about uh, architecture uh, uh, related to traditional indigenous medicine and healing practice of indigenous medi medicine people, something like that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Perfect. Yeah. So uh, this, is the, this is the panel today. One of the ten. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, as a modera moderator, I will ask uh, two questions. To um, to my people today, and they have uh, for the first uh, question five minutes um, to answer the question. Uh, so you Start should know the clock. you should know that uh, Bonita. <laughs> 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 I have a class in I, I, one month. I have been uh, in two years in in the health and well-being working group, and <laughs> I know that Bonita can talk long time. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I have learned a lot about uh, issues that is uh, f uh, far from my hometown, that is in Tromsø, but in, in yep. Canada. Yep. So, I will start uh, uh, with the first uh, qu question, and the first question is uh, like this, given the interdisciplinarity of all of your scholarship, how do you see the Fulbright Arctic Initiative has developed? and supported your work. And uh, I will uh, start with <coughs> Leno. You have uh, five minutes. The floor is yours. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Kettle, for uh, such a brilliant introduction. <laughs> slides. Huh? Slides. slides. Oh, yeah, slides. slides. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and thank you, everyone, for uh, making this uh, possible. Uh, uh, my individual research um, focus in the framework of the Fulbright program is indigenous subsistence practices uh, of Saha people in the Arctic, and uh, specifically I focused on Arctic traditional horse herding. And uh, I conducted my research first at my uh, homeland, Saha Republic, and then at the University of Northern Iowa uh, Arctic Center. Uh, and answering the question how this uh, Fulbright scholarship has shaped and advanced my research is, well, uh, my background is uh, pretty much uh, related to physical sciences, uh, satellite images, and uh, Fulbright gave me this opportunity to uh, focus more on uh, what could be in practice be done uh, in order to contribute uh, to the development of my own community. And because uh, you see beautiful pictures of uh, tra uh, traditional horses, uh, Saha breed of horses are very unique and uh, this uh, is a very unique way of breeding in the harsh climatic uh, conditions of the Arctic. Uh, even when the temperatures goes below uh, minus 60 Celsius. And uh, Saha breed of horses are contemporaries and the same age of mammoth, bisons, and cave lions. And uh, nowadays, uh, this uh, horse husbandry uh, constitutes, well, mm, this is not only uh, our uh, main food base, but also uh, constitutes a very important cultural and spiritual and historical significance for the Saha people. And uh, a relatively large number of studies has been conducted uh, on uh, effect of climate change on the reindeer husbandry, but by comparison, it uh, its effect on uh, horse husbandry has been largely unexplored. And uh, I was able to conduct this research uh, in totally different uh, new area for me in terms of academia. Uh, and uh, speaking and discussion uh, with the researchers at the University of uh, Northern Iowa at the Arctic Center expanded my uh, experience and uh, knowledge and skills in this new area like exponentially. 
And also, I would like especially highlight uh, cultural experience I had uh, during my individual research. Uh, thanks to the Arctic Center, I was able to meet indigenous people of Turtle Island. And this gave me so much food for thought uh, about the indigenous knowledge, about its role in the future of the Arctic and its development. Uh, because, you know, uh, in view of uh, future changes, I mean not only ecological, but also financial, industrial, um, there is an increased need uh, in understanding of uh, these changes deeper. And also, um, it is highlighted in many agendas of very prominent uh, organizations that this era calls for a new ontology. And therefore, uh, it is important to bring into a meaningful conversation uh, indigenous knowledge and science. And to conclude, I would like to say that uh, Fulbright program, uh, what we've learned here and the experience we've gained uh, during this program is already our unique component uh, that cannot be replicated elsewhere. And thank you for the Fulbright program for making this happen. Thank you. I started my um, research project on uh, indigenous self-determination, uh, governance, and gender over 10 years ago. Uh, that became the book that uh, Ketil mentioned. It was a comparative uh, project uh, focusing on uh, SAPMI, where I come from, Greenland, and northern, uh, well, northern and southern parts of Canada. And initially, uh, I wanted to include Alaska as well. And uh, I'm very glad that, that I didn't. And I realized that specifically when I went there last year, um, but also while writing the book, like I, uh, I, I thought initially, I, like Ketil was saying, we don't recognize borders. But when you talk about self-determination in Scandinavia, you're actually talking about three different jurisdictions, not just one. I, when I was drafting the uh, proposal, I was thinking it's Greenland. Uh, Canada and SAPMI, but it's actually five jurisdictions. So it was a, it was it was a lot of work uh, writing the book, which is why that I, I'm happy I didn't have Alaska on top of it. So when I saw this uh, call for Fulbright Arctic Initiative three, I jumped at it because I thought here's my finally my chance, ten years later to go to uh, Alaska. So in my uh, in the book, uh, I, it's uh, in the comparative research, I I was interested in in. Uh, figuring out and understanding the relationship between indigenous self-determination and gender uh, justice. And it became that book, uh, uh, and one of the things I do in that book, I, I uh, develop a theory of indigenous self-determination. Uh, uh, I argue that in addition um, uh, of being it a right uh, recognized in international law, it is also a shared value uh, that a group uh, uh, sees as ind indispensable for their well-being. So um, uh, I wanted to. Uh, this is my. This was my initial idea uh, to include Alaska as well. Uh, but Alaska is very. When I was drafting my pr uh, proposal for the uh, Fulbright Arctic uh, Initiative, the call. I realized that Alaska self-government is very complicated uh, uh, due to historical, legal, and political uh, uh, reasons. Uh, maybe you can put the uh, photo there, the next one. So uh, um, in the late 60s, um, uh, oil was found in, in uh, uh, northern uh, Alaska on the Arctic Ocean. So it became imperative to um, figure out the native Alaska land claim that had uh, that was outstanding and ha had become uh, increasingly a, a question uh, defining the state and and the and the particularly the economic development of the state. So this is the photo. The the uh, picture on the left is the uh, Trans Alaska Pipeline that uh, prompted uh, the uh, Alaska Native um, Settlement Act that was uh, uh, signed in 1971. Uh, which uh, settled uh, Alaska Native land claims. Um, in many ways, it's been um, considered a, a successful um, uh, experiment of indigenous self-determination, particularly in terms of economic development, generating econo economic development 
um, in native Alaska communities. On the other hand, it has kind of muddled the waters in terms of Alaska native self-government. It uh, extinguished completely native Alaska uh, subsistence rights, which has been a sticking point ever since. But what was very interesting, I, I went to Alaska for six weeks last year, and during my visit, Anksa had just uh, turned 50. So uh, there were a lot of different um, the, uh, attention paid to the fact, like looking back, looking forward, has Anksa, has, uh, has it been successful and, and to what extent, and what are the, uh, the shortcomings? So. Um, I was uh, uh, lucky enough to be there for the, uh, uh, for the Arctic encounter in Anchorage, where ANCSA was discussed extensively. And right before my departure, uh, there was uh, at the University of Fairbanks, uh, Alaska Fairbanks, where I was um, visiting, there was an ANCSA at 50 symposium. And uh, so the um, next, the picture, the other picture, but you can't probably see what the sa it says. It's the museum, uh, uh, the University of uh, Alaska Fairbanks Museum, which is a beautiful building inside and outside. But in front of it, there's a sign that says the future site of the, um, I had to look at my notes, uh, the Troth Yetha Indigenous uh, Studies Center. Uh, they have selected the site for indigenous studies, uh, but they don't have ra they haven't raised enough funding to start building it. So at the end of that ANCSA uh, 50 symposium, uh, uh, one of the Alaska Native corporations um, announced a one million dollar uh, uh, donation toward that uh, development, that center. So I found it like uh, um, that this kind of interesting, like uh, the, because the, at the heart of the question of Alaska Native self-government are these ANCSA corporations, Alaska Native uh, corporations. Uh, uh, Alaska Native self-government uh, has been very much uh, done through this very unique structure of uh, 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 Native corporations. Uh, but uh, then there are these challenging questions of uh, the relationship between the tribal governments and the corporations. But on the other hand, you can see in this picture like a very concrete example of, of the, the benefits of economic development that, that uh, through these corporations, uh, uh, they enable the uh, uh, building like the uh, indigenous studies uh, uh, center, which are very much needed, uh, like Alaska Fairbanks, uh, University of Alaska Fairbanks has done a very good job in the past few years uh, recruiting more indigenous scholars and developing indigenous studies program, pro various programs. So um, it's sort of like the pipeline that was built as the result of the uh, settling the Alaska Native land claims and the establishment of Native Alaska corporations uh, and then how they fund very key initiatives. Uh, they are all entangled in, uh, into this question of uh, Alaska, what is Alaska Native uh, self-government. And uh, I'm still piecing it together. I'm writing an article uh, um, uh, about my research. And there are very different layers of challenges that I'm, I have been able to focus on as the result of my Fulbright research. And I'm glad that I didn't do it earlier. But now I have the luxury of uh, dedicating myself to that particular question. Thank you. Well, um, um, I, I'm also a political scientist. My first language is Cree. I'm from northern Saskatchewan. And, um, <laughs> and, um, but I come from a hunting and trapping and commercial fishing uh, background. Uh, so and, uh, and in, in northern Saskatchewan, we have uh, what we call the subarctic um, ecological type of environment, lakes, high, big hills. So Saskatchewan is not just flat. You know, in the, the north of us, we're the majority uh, indigenous people, First Nations, Métis, Dene, are the majority up there. And uh, its size is about the size of, uh, of uh, Germany. So, I mean, you know, it's a, it's, a big, it's a big land. And I was really impressed when I thought I come from a big land and I ended up in, in Alaska. <laughs> That's a really big land. <laughs> and, um, and so uh, it was, um, it was uh, truly a, um, 
um, a gift to me, and and I'm and I'm so very thankful for for the people of that I met. I've I met over 26 people, uh, groups, agencies, representing groups, agencies, leaders, elder leaders, uh, including Willie Hensley, who I spent a lot of time with, who negotiated the Native Claims Land Self Government Agreement, and also set up the first assembly, um, uh, the um, um, the First Nations, or not First Nations, but the Alaska um, Federation of Native Association or something like that. But it's the biggest organization representing the tribes, the various tribes in, in Alaska. But what I was interested in, in, in Alaska for um, was for this thing on health systems. So I wanted to, to look at um, what kind of governance. I'm a political scientist, and, and my area was in public service. I wanted to learn about bureaucracies. How are they set up to deliver health services? And my, you know, I've, uh, I've worked in government as well, and I've also worked uh, as well with my tribal council and bands to look at setting up our First Nations health services. And so how did that look like on the ground? How do you integrate traditional values into, that, into the system of administration? How do you do that? So it's kind of like what we call, so we have these standards, it's like labor standards plus, health services plus. So it's a step above the standards. And so that's how we looked at it because we incorporate culture, linguistic concepts, language, and so forth. And so in, in the research, as I said, I've, I networked with uh, wonderful people, um, Iser, the Institute of Social and Economic Research, a former colleague, Diane, head of it, and uh, she networked me to a lot of people, and the, including the, the lady I stayed with, who, uh, who was also um, a former assistant or to uh, um, the late governor, and, um, and so was well networked. I met a lot of people through there, so it just kind of continued rolling. And uh, when I did that information gathering, it's so important when you go to a, a, a foreign area, to me it's a foreign country, uh, I had these ideas in my head, <laughs> and um, and uh, you know to be networked, and I'm thankful for Susan and and, and Beth and all these people who kind of sh followed me through the airports to the till I got to where I was, and then people being there and knowing that they they were behind that I that I wasn't stuck, and um, so the idea of making connections was the important thing. So I did a lot of research, uh, finding out who people were, how they were the structures politically were set up, service wise how they were set up. And uh, what we call the, in, in, in Creek Yogi, in um, uh, a research method, indigenous research method, is about the visiting way. I think it's pretty typical of, of most, uh, you know, uh, that you spend time visiting and talking to people. And then, and then from there you find the connections of, uh, and you can get into the details of what you want. So after I did this, I found that um, um, the, the, I needed to look about at exploring practical s solutions and strategies to, to things that uh, were very, um, um, the, the, the chronic uh, problems. And so one of the things in health for elders and youth. And so what I found that uh, with the three health developments that stood out for me were the tribally managed hospital, the primary care and elders program, and the traditional healing clinic. And, and I spent a lot of time with the elders program and they fed me muktuk and everything else. And it was really good to see how they blended their primary care and their, um, their cultural care with people right at their bedside and in the community and uh, really respected the dignity of the people that they worked with. So that's it. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Kettle, and also thanks for your talk on, uh, I was just also in um, Alaska and went to those same locations yep. that you did and they were absolutely amazing buildings and they are way ahead of anywhere that I've seen in North America with, uh, you know, healthcare for indigenous people. I just wanted to make sure that this mic's okay because it says do not adjust, but I completely 150% adjusted it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, and also as Lena mentioned, the, um, the continent that we're on is Turtle Island and it's one landmass that, you know, has had indigenous people on it for uh, thousands of years since time immemorial. And so my research is indigenous uh, based research and it needed to include North America. So it was fantastic with Fulbright to be part of this organization that not only meeting with all these um, amazing scholars who are also part of the program and the administrators and whatnot, but also just the opportunity to come to the States. And I've been traveling through for quite some time now and 
meeting uh, other indigenous people from here and creating those relationships that are going to be critical to my research uh, that's ongoing and whatnot for my PhD. So uh, as you mentioned, um, Kettle, that uh, I'm a First Nations architect uh, and uh, currently doing research for my PhD. And through my research, I hope to create the awareness uh, of the importance of indigenous health and its betterment through pollinating and understanding of the places and spaces that need to be designed in architecture for the reestablishment of the practices of indigenous medicine people and traditional healers. So looking at the images behind me, I just wanted to talk about some things that inspired me to do this research. And the uh, one on the bottom is a picture of my great grandma and my great grandfather. Um, who I've never met my great-grandfather. He passed away before I was born. But my great-grandmother was, um, she looks old there, but that was like in the 60s. And she lived till 111, and she only died 10 years ago. So she was born before 1900 and 18, and end of the 1800s. But, you know, and I lived with her because I also lived with my grandparents who we, she would come and live with us from time to time. And my grandmother passed away when she was 65, 10 years before her. And, um, you know, my grandmother and my mother went to residential school, and there's a whole layer of colonialism that uh, was attached with that, and also attached with the fact of um, the creation of indigenous people as having some of the worst health comes of all races in North America. And so my great-grandmother, who lived till 111, lived much more of a traditional lifestyle, didn't go to residential school than my grandmother, who lived till, till, till 65. Um, but uh, so the other two images also that were an inspiration to me. This, these uh, are the of the uh, Trishal Healing Camp in Yellowknife, uh, so which is in the Northwest Territories, which is really far north and kind of west of Alaska, <laughs> um, in central northern Canada. But uh, they, are, they were created by the Arctic Indigenous Wellness Foundation, and the foundation was created by uh, the um, uh, Dene and Inuit elders and medicine people, uh, some of my elders, uh, to conduct their healing practices uh, for the health of our local indigenous population. And currently they, are, um, they conduct their business out of these te teepees and tents, but I helped them with a conceptual design uh, of a permanent uh, building that, that um, they could use in the future of, you know, contemporarily constructed materials. And so because of my expertise in uh, healthcare design, I was asked to assist them with that. And I, um, made me want to learn more about traditional healing practices and how to bring those, how to bring that understanding uh, and culturally into uh, architecture, into the architecture of healthcare for indigenous people. So in the hopes that uh, the information that I collect in this research and compile and share will help other uh, similar organizations with the ultimate goal of an overall betterment of uh, indigenous health and the reclamation of our of our traditional health practices and our other cultural practices. So I think it's uh, been a great experience with Fulbright to ha to expand that and to uh, be able to include the, uh, you know, is it one minute left? Or am I well, that's what they're saying. <laughs> okay. I'm fine with you, but go ahead. <laughs> so when she said she was from northern Saskatchewan, I'm from more north than her, so <laughs> we call her Southern. <laughs> That's true. That's true. But thank you. Okay, thank you so much for answering the first question I asked. And I have one question more, and you just have one minute to answer the question. <laughs> so it's a very short time. So but, uh, we go like this right off the start. Yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> So uh, the question number two is, uh, how do you envision your research contributing to the future of the Arctic? 
And we can start with Chris this time and go the other way. Okay, so as I said, I'm from very far north and she's from kind of <laughs> south, southern Canada. And so if uh, just to kind of understand where I'm from, if you went west from here, you'd be going 2,000 miles to the west and then another 3,000 miles to the north, which is 3,000, 3,300 kilometers for us that do kilometers and uh, to the west and then 5,000 kilometers more to the north of where this location is. So um, my province and territory is the Northwest Territories and the landmass is huge. It's 500,000 uh, square miles. And if you just want to get a picture of that, is California is 163,000 and Alaska is 60, 665,000. So it's a big landmass and we have 45,000 people in 30 communities. And so it's an extremely small population, very spread out. And has anybody watched Ice Road Truckers on history or Ice Pilots? That's in the town that I live. So that's how we get our stuff around is on ice roads and whatnot. So it's very remote and very uh, difficult to, to get to. And through intergenerational trauma, we have the second highest suicide rate in Canada. And uh, the first being Nunavut, which is the territory that broke away from us in 1999, which is next, next to us. Uh, and so I just, uh, I'm hoping that my research will help uh, with the create the indigenous healing facilities where people can reclaim our traditional healing and so that we can reclaim our cultures and create a healthy environment, indigenous communities in the Arctic. Thank you. Thank you. Bonita, your minute. That was a long minute. <laughs> so here's your minute. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, I'll take a minute. Um, one of the things that I learned, um, you know, we all live in this planet, and certainly in the North we all live in this planet, and one of the things is this notion, and it's an indigenous notion, no matter what language you come from or, or, or tribe or background you come from, and it's the idea of family and kinship. Kinship is your friends, family, and people that live around you and, and your region and so on, and so these all these intersecting circles. Wagoto in, in Cree, Talks, talks about the spirit of relatedness. We have to remember that the spirit and the, and the physical, mental, and so when we're talking about it in terms of systems, people, things like economics is important, yes, but people, language, culture, and values are, are, are the other side of it, and you're not going to get sustainability until you have both. So with that, and that's the kind of language I, I heard from the, the elders in, in, in Anchorage, plus also mine, and, and I'm taking a group back in the end of June. And so that's, that's uh, I want them to hear all the stuff too. So. Thank you. Can I come? No. Uh, <laughs> when I was in uh, Fairbanks, I learned that there is also a salmon crisis there. I, um, I'm not a reindeer herder. I know uh, Ketil's family has reindeer, like uh, Samia often associated with reindeer. My, people, uh, my family doesn't have reindeer. Uh, I come from a big salmon river, one of the uh, last remaining uh, uh, wild Atlantic uh, salmon rivers in Europe. So, uh, and, and there's a salmon crisis there as well. So, uh, in collaboration with uh, my colleagues at UAF, um, we started to work on this uh, comparative uh, uh, project on, um, on uh, the salmon crisis and the future of indigenous salmon fisheries. And so, so actually, this is what I'm drafting the uh, proposal, uh, funding proposal for the European Research Council as we speak to examine how the future of indigenous salmon uh, fisheries is best understood and secured in the Arctic. And our uh, hypothesis is that enhanced governance based on indigenous knowledge, shared decision making and robust, robust policy making secures the interwoven uh, uh, futures of Arctic uh, salmon and indigenous, uh, Arctic indigenous peoples. So it combines food sovereignty, one health, uh, and, and gender analysis framework and through the lens of future scenarios, but also indigenous futurities, like the kind of, uh, somebody mentioned at University of um, Arizona, the science fiction, the kind of like this is discourse in Arctic, uh, uh, sorry, indigenous futurities. So that's part of that project as well. Thank you. Well, my uh, vision is that we are gradually moving towards a holistic understanding of the world. And uh, for that, to my, uh, f uh, f from my own personal perspective, 
Uh, for the complete transition, it is uh, imperative and necessary to bring into a conversation and that uh, science and indigenous knowledge come together. And I believe that my research uh, could be one of the bridges uh, that could build uh, this, could bring into the conversation these two ways of knowing, right? Because at the fundamental level, uh, current worldview and uh, science itself are built on the basis um, of singling out the outside world and uh, some kind of extraneous structure. And in opposite, uh, on the contrary, in indigenous knowledge, more than everything is interconnected. Uh, there is like, we are one. And uh, if we will aware of this, and if uh, this awareness uh, will, this awareness can change the whole approach uh, to the policy itself and all the social norms. Thank you so much. <laughs> time go very fast when we have good time together. <laughs> So now we open for question to the participants uh, on the panel um, from the hall. So we have some question here. The, is it the lady up there with in blue first? Um, thank you. So um, I've heard about this theory that because of global warming, um, as like southern regions get um, like warmer, but like hotter and more uninhabitable, and northern regions get um, warmer and more inhabitable. That means people are going to have to um, like start moving more and more north, which means like like people are going to have to be moving into like indigenous northern land, perhaps. Um, and that historically, like obviously, hasn't been good. Um, so I wonder, like. If, if any of you have any like thoughts about that or, or what could be done. Who want to answer the question? Yeah. Actually, uh, th uh, that's a very timely question. That's something actually uh, that is part of my uh, proposal that I'm uh, currently drafting. Beca uh, talking about changing Arctic, yes, climate change is one factor, but climate change affects uh, uh, the Arctic in so many ways. And one of the ways that we haven't really looked uh, at is the question of climate migration that uh, yes, there's climate migration in Alaska, like the, some villages need to be relocated. But uh, when the uh, planet gets hotter and some places in the south become more and more in uninhabitable, these people, some of these uh, climate uh, migrants, that uh, the, the estimates uh, are like in, in millions, if not billions, uh, in the coming uh, decades, some of them are, will end up in the Arctic. So this is the question, and of course, uh, um, Everywhere in the world, there is this backlash uh, against migration, uh, refugees, climate refugees. So, so the, my, one of the questions that I want to um, consider in the pro proposal or the research uh, is that um, how do we accommodate, like how do we see migration as an asset rather than a fear, uh, like, a, like um, a threat and a danger? Like can it be done in a way that, that at the same time secures basic indigenous rights, uh, say, the, the, and salmon fisheries. How could it be done? Uh, could it be done? Like, uh, that's the question that I, I, I look forward to finding out. Yes? Um, and I think it'll go it'll coincide with uh, my, my friend here to my left. Um, but, uh, it, you know, self-government and, and capacity building in the local communities at the, at the local level, um, and I mean capacity building in terms of infrastructure, in terms of uh, long-term planning. Um, you know, we have our own, our, our treaties. We also have a lot of, and it's so long as the, the sun rises and, and, the, and the rivers flow and so on, and people Grass have, grows. yeah. And people have always says, how long are you gonna, how long is your plant? 10 years, five years? I said, is the sun still shining or is the <laughs> grass still growing? I mean, so part of the thing is it's the process and it's a long-term human process. And uh, we know people are gonna be, coming because they're, we've been relocated many times. There's the, the whole history, no need, no, no need to go into all of that. But uh, in the north, certainly there's been a lot of relocations anyway. And, um, and, and there is going to, uh, and, and sometimes it was, you know, uh, weather, weather warranted. 
And uh, but certainly one of the things we we've looked at is is disaster disaster risk management uh, in terms of the climate change issues on around water, around forest fires, and so forth. So there is strategies in place, and there's a lot more direction. There's also an international indigenous connectivity association that I happen to belong to that deals with more information getting out to people. And, uh, and I think as, as long as you have a solid capacity, and, and just, just to give you an example, in the pandemic that just happened in Alaska, as well as northern Saskatchewan, and, and, and also in, 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 in all the, the provincial Canada north, um, we found that, and Nunavut even, that, uh, that we found that uh, the, 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 the tribes and the bands that took over and had the capacity to have a, 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 a fairly well-established health system were able to to um, roll out the vaccinations much more effectively than even the the, the Western um, health systems, Thank and you. Um, and so so it's that was that was exactly what they said. <laughs> yeah. We have one more question. Uh, two more questions. We take the. Yeah, we can take them both. Hi, so I come from a background, my research focuses on gender mainstreaming and the ways that the policies we recommend have disparate effects on women opposed to men and people with on the diverse gender spectrum. And so I'm curious, when we're prioritizing like these, when we're prioritizing justice and especially like indigenous justice, how do you go about navigating the hierarchies that exist within indigenous communities and making sure that women's voices and concerns are heard, especially with your work, Chris, because I, uh, like focus specifically on architecture and I work with a lot of like female healthcare architects and the way that we design architectures in general are going to like, they need to be tailored like to the completely different lifestyles and roles that women play in societies. I know Rona, you have the name gender in your book title. So I'm sure you have something to say on that as well. You know, I'm a two-spirit individual and I was, um, you know, oftentimes navigate or migrate over towards uh, like women's issues, but I think that a lot of our societies, uh, native societies in North America are matriarchal and <clears throat> they became patriarchal over the last few hundred years because of colonialism, because of uh, Catholicism and the other uh, religions. And so I think that as we start to regain our cultures and we start to look at things through this new, like this, this lens of decolonization that I hope that we are going to be, you know, not preferring, but including women and everybody's voices as one voice in, in a holistic manner, not just men's voices, if that answers your question. I guess I can uh, answer very quickly. Yes, that, that's the, the very question in my book, and um, I'm trying to think a way of putting it very briefly. Um, I make the case that when we talk about indigenous uh, self-determination and indigenous governance structures, institutions, um, uh, we need to look at, like uh, indigenous self-determination discourse tends to look focus on the indigenous state relations, but my, my key argument uh, in the book is that we need to look at all the all relations of domination from the very uh, micro to the uh, 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 macro level. So, and we need to restructure all all relation, relations of domination. And and one uh, um, question is like th th there's kind of the sh gender regimes uh, that are are, are uh, very persistent and uh, uh, obvious and, and and present in mainstream institutions. They are very much present in many of the. Uh, like the kind of mainstream indigenous political institutions as well, but then there are these uh, these grassroots uh, grassroots initiatives like of, of uh, what are increasingly called as uh, as rematriation, like reclaiming those structures that used to exist, and and figuring out how they could serve best in in our current. How can they be incorporated or perhaps restructure those institutions existing institutions in a way that that would be more. And sometimes you mean uh, like. Uh, uh, Ad addressing the question of gender injustice. And sometimes it might mean kind of like uh, gender division of labor, and not between men and women, but uh, the, like you said, the, the entire gender spectrum. Thank you. And then we have a last question. Yeah, um, so this is largely directed towards Chris, but I ask any of you to answer. Um, I was curious, you mentioned, you know, your mother and grandmother attending residential schools, and then your work focused kind of on indigenous ways of healing. I'm thinking about how we're at, 
I would say the very beginning of a nascent stage of what I hope will be meaningful reconciliation. And I think a big part of that is supporting the resurgence of indigenous ways of knowing and indigenous languages. I'm an anthropologist by trade and I have studied the resurgence of Irish in Ireland. And so I'm kind of curious from an indigenous perspective, um, what you think kind of supporting these older ways of knowing coming back could yeah, look like? Yeah, I think that in terms of um, my research in traditional uh, facilities that, that allow for medicine people to conduct traditional healing, a lot of it that I'm finding out and talking to people now is not just about the, tr the traditional healing, the plants or the ceremonies or whatnot. A lot of it is about the reclamation of language. A lot of it is about the teaching of from our elders to our youth about um, you know, our traditional ways so that those ways aren't lost. And I'm finding that the part of the healing in the healing center is reclamation of culture, not just reclamation of healing practices. So a lot of it is about, you know, learning to build a canoe again out of birch bark. And you might take that canoe out then to go harvest medicine on the land. So it's, uh, it's in a holistic, I mean, it's a holistic approach to health. So it includes communities, uh, and they oftentimes, they become community centers and uh, more about than just the individual at that level. Okay, thank you so much. I think we end here um, and we can uh, continue the discussion in, at the reception from both the panel. So, yeah. you want to say something? Yeah, so just um, thank you everybody for spending the past couple hours with us. And as Kettle said, there is a reception now, so please stay. You're welcome to interact with um, all of us and, and certainly all the scholars. Ask them any questions um, that you have. And we just really want to thank the, the Wilson Center and the Polar Institute for um, this lovely space and for all of you and coming and um, listening and sharing with us all of the amazing work that our 19 scholars have done over the past two years. And of course, Fulbright um, in all its shapes and sizes that are in the room from the Fulbright commissions um, across the Arctic and the US State Department. So thank you, everybody. Thank you.